May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before I begin, may I wish you all a very happy Christmas on behalf of myself and everyone else in the churches in the Penarth area. What I want to do in this sermon, in this uh, reflection piece, is to ask a question. What's the point of Christmas? Well, it's clearly something to do with the birth of a particular baby, isn't it? Um, a particular baby called Jesus. Um, I think we could all agree about that. But as members of the Church in Wales, members of the Worldwide Anglican Communion, we're in a rather privileged place um, in Christianity because we have a particular view on things which others don't have to the same extent. We particularly value an idea called incarnation. Incarnation. It's all about God being born as man, God being one of us. And that's important because it has implications for the future, it has implications for the process of judgment in the future and access to everlasting life. Before looking at the true meaning of Christmas, uh, let me just go back a little bit and talk about the season that's just ended, which is Advent. Not just a countdown to Christmas, uh, but a season in its own right. A season of reflection when we think about life and death, resurrection, life everlasting, about the new resurrection bodies that we get um, after we have died, about a new earth and about a new heaven. The Bible tells us that everyone must die, and then, according to the Bible, there'll be a general resurrection, a judgment, and after which, if you're ready, you get to spend eternity with God in community with others. This business of judgment is fascinating, um, and it has been misused, I think, by the church in the past, who form some very strange beliefs about it. Um, and indeed, even today, uh, notions of guilt and punishment, punishment are still abound. Um, and uh, actually, it's used in some rather unpleasant ways, I think, uh, in increasing the guilt feelings of people um, who feel that they have to respond, therefore, in certain ways. Well, <clears throat> in Anglicanism, and other denominations too, uh, judgment does exist, don't get me wrong. But there's less of a guilt trip uh, with it uh, in our own particular denomination. In Romans 8, it says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that's important. This is all about love. God is love. Knowing God makes us um, understand that this concept of judgment and of a courtroom type thing going on after death is not really compatible with the idea of a loving God. Some sort of discernment must take place. Yes, I agree about that. But the idea of a courtroom and going through your life with nitty gritty, uh, going through everything with a fine tooth comb and uh, putting you on trial. Well, that's a different matter. The purpose of judgment, after all, is to see if we're ready yet to spend eternity with God and with other people in community. If we're not ready, well, some time needs to take place uh, before we're asked the question again. Are we now ready to spend time with God and with others? If we're not ready, then we destroy the harmony that exists between God and other people and God and us and us and other people. So it's important to get it right, isn't it? Um, so there has to be some sort of discernment process. But it doesn't have to be like a courtroom. And this is where Christmas comes in. God designated that his son would be our judge. He would decide whether we're ready for heaven um, now. Are we ready for heaven now? Are we ready to spend time with God? Are we ready to spend time with other people? Are we ready to spend time with ourselves 
for all eternity? Have all these niggles and questions and problems gone away? Or do we need some more time before we ask the question once again? Jesus acts as a loving judge because he wants us to be a part of it all. He wants us to be there with him in company with God and with other people for all eternity. He's got a vested interest in getting us through the process. Now it's all very well God understanding for himself that he's a perfect judge because he knows himself and he knows us inside out. But knowing us inside out and knowing that we are curious beings and that we have free will, he understands that we need a little bit of coaxing. We need to understand God and to trust God and to love God. And so he sent his son to be one of us. Not because God didn't know what was in our hearts and minds, of course, but because he wanted to show us that he understood what it was to be human. That's why Jesus was sent to us. That's why God was born and became one of us in human form. To live a life as a human being, so that we could understand that God knew everything about being a human. And this baby that was born in the stable in Bethlehem did everything that was normal for a human being to do and to be. Uh, he was born hungry and fed on his mother's milk. When he was cold, he needed the warmth of the hay and blankets provided by his mum and dad. Uh, he used the equivalent of nappies in those days. He would have experienced growing pains like other children. Um, he was bundled up and rushed out of the country when killers threatened to come and to murder him and his family. And he spent some time as an asylum seeker in Africa. Later, Jesus may have been bullied at the equivalent of school. He may have formed a, a crush on one of the people in his little village. Um, he may have struggled with his career or with some aspect of his training. He may have, have, have had difficult relationships with other people in the village or with a family member. Who knows? Um, we also know that he had to encounter uh, the death of his father, perhaps, before the age of 30, because there's no mention of Joseph after a certain time point. So sometime in the, between the age of 12 and 30, Joseph was off the scene and therefore he must have known grief. Jesus also did other things. He formed friendships. He danced at weddings. He went fishing with his friends. And he also experienced the physical pain of, of torture, uh, the emotional pain of being publicly humiliated before his crucifixion um, and he was killed slowly painfully in front of his friends and family including his mother Mary. So Jesus did whatever it was possible for a human being to do and so he knows what it's like to be human from the inside out. Quite often we say at Christmas when the gifts um, of the three kings, the Magi, turn up, um, that this baby Jesus, born in Bethlehem, was born to die when we see the gift of the myrrh appearing. But I also say that this baby was not just born to die, but born to live, live as one of us, live life as a human being, to know what it's like to be human from the inside out. And that is important. And we know that that is true because when we encounter God after our death, when he lifts up his hands, we will see the mark of the nails and the physical pain that he endured. It's there, if you like, in black and white for all to see. Jesus knows what it's like to be one of us. So at judgment, when we meet our Christ, our Redeemer, our Judge, no one knows what questions we will be asked in order to determine if we are ready 
uh, to spend eternity with one another, and with ourselves, and with God. But we do know that those questions will be informed questions, because Jesus led a human life. And we can have confidence in knowing that he's on our side, urging us on. He has a vested interest in getting us through the process, because that's what he wants for us. He knows us, he loves us, he understands us. That's the meaning of incarnation. That's why God was born as one of us that first Christmas. I believe that uh, God is not interested in judging us in the way that we think that we ought to be judged, as we would judge one another. We're really quite harsh critics of ourselves and of other people, aren't we? I don't think it's like that with God, and I don't think it's like that with Jesus because of the incarnation of his birth and his life as one of us. He will go a bit more easily because he knows what it's like to be human. Because of the incarnation, God wants us to know that he will do everything possible to get us into eternal life with him and everyone else in his company forevermore. And this might reflect in the questions that he might ask us. I wonder what his first question would be. Are you ready to live with yourself in harmony for all eternity? It's an interesting question. We're often very harsh critics of ourselves, aren't we? But are we ready to put all that to one side and to start a new phase of our existence? All the badness gone, all the criticism of ourselves gone, for whatever reason. Is it all put to one side? Can we move on with this new life, with God and with others and with ourselves? And perhaps there's this second question too. Are we ready to live with others in harmony for all eternity? Basically, are we at peace with ourselves now that life is no more? Have we finished judging ourselves and criticising ourselves? And also, have we finished criticising others for everything that goes on? Are we ready to live in harmony for the rest of time? Are we, in short, ready to become all that we were destined to be? Cardinal Basil Hume said that judgment is about whispering the story of your life into the ear of Jesus. Whispering the story of your life into the ear of Jesus. It's not about scales of justice. It's about putting the pain of life to one side. And that happens not with a therapist, but in conversation with someone who loves you and knows you and who understands. God who was incarnated to be one of us. God could have asked, why weren't you Doris Smith, the one and only Doris Smith I ever created in the history of the world? But I think the more likely question is, are you now ready to become that Doris Smith that you and I both dreamed about? Are you ready to do that? For all eternity. Readiness for heaven is about a conversation with God, and that conversation is with someone who knows what it is to be human and who loves you. Someone incarnated. Someone who is one of us and has been one of us. Someone for whom it all started in a stable in Bethlehem. And that for me, is the true meaning of Christmas. Amen.